Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Alan Armakanyan. I'm the director of the Akokian Center for the Environment at AUA. Uh, we're a center that is devoted to um, biodiversity conservation, natural resource use management, um, um, and I'm an urban planner by training, so my interest is the uh, impact of the built environment on the natural environment and how that can be minimized. So we have a lot of different interests in our center, and hydropower clearly is one of those um, fields which directly impacts uh, the natural environment. Um, it provides us with energy security, and if done right, but at the same time, uh, there are environmental risks that we need to understand and manage. Um, and uh, we are very fortunate that for the past two, three years, the Norwegian government has funded a project of improving sustainable uh, development of small hydropower plants in Armenia. As you know, there are about 170, 180 uh, small hydropower plants in the country. Another 70, 80 is proposed to be built. Um, and uh, we're uh, estimating to have about a capacity of about 400 megawatts of uh, uh, small hydropower uh, in the country. Uh, whether we will achieve our um, energy policy goals of, um, or not will depend how well we built those small hydropower plants. In the process also, we will have to ensure that we do not do more harm than get benefit out of those uh, investments. Uh, harm in terms of environmental impact, social impact, and so we're fortunate that this project is able to bring us know-how, uh, capacity, build up our capacity to uh, uh, understand and learn how to do uh, small hydropower plant development uh, in a more sustainable, in a more uh, environmentally friendly and socially um, uh, positive way. Uh, so with that, we're very glad to have two guest lecturers today who are being brought within the framework of this Norwegian-Armenian cooperation <coughs> on small hydropower plant development. We have many representatives of the project also here. Andre uh, is here, and Caroline right, is here, yes. And Inessa Gabayans uh, and, and uh, Mr. Gabayan is also here. They've been involved in this project from the get-go. And our two uh, experts mm -hmm. who are here from Norway, uh, they're with Sweco, which is an engineering firm and they'll tell you a little bit more about that, uh, are, are here with us on two very interesting topics. One, uh, Wolf uh, Marchand will talk about optimal design and monitoring of hydropower plants, small hydropower plants, and then uh, Iba will tell us um, uh, how to uh, properly do environmental and social impact assessment and what standards they use in Norway. And I think the Norway experience is, uh, we could, at least for us right now, consider the gold standard and see how we can achieve that gold standard. With that, I hand it over to Wolf. Can you hear me when I have this uh, from here? Yes. Okay. yes, thank you for the introduction, Alan. Yes, everybody has that. Okay. You have to be Arachin Kana Libraptin, you make make Libraptin. You have to be on channel one if you want to hear the translations. <laughs> Yes, um, let me first uh, give you an overview on the lecture, on the presentation. I'm glad that uh, so many could come today. It was very exciting for us to see who's coming, actually. Um, first, uh, I will give you a, a definition how uh, we see the, the term of uh, optimal design. Uh, and then I will give you an explanation on the framework uh, concerning authorities, legislative acts and guidelines, the different planning phases which are important. Uh, 
later on we uh, switch to monitoring and supervision. What is the purpose of monitoring? The duration, uh, the monitoring during construction phase and during operation phase. What are the difference? Differences. Um, the role between the different authorities and developers and the public mm -hmm. and the consultants and how the authorities perform their control function in Norway um, and what what is the role of the public in controlling and monitoring and which kind of methods are used. Uh, I will uh, mainly talk about our experience uh, in Norway, but uh, a lot of these principles can also be transferred to other countries, or they are used similar in other countries, but uh, the laws, of course, uh, can vary a little bit. Let me first come to the definition. We consider we consider the optimal design to be a design that achieves, achieves uh, the maximize maximization of benefit and minimization of disadvantages. Of course, uh, that is a very complex uh, process around this optimal design. It includes uh, several important issues, like technical issues, economical issues, environmental issues, and social issues. Many of these issues are also interconnected. So if one issue is changed, uh, it will have impact on the other issue. So let me uh, have a look at the different issues a little bit more closely. Um, the technical issue first. One very important thing is uh, the hydrology, because uh, this is uh, the available, available water resource, what is, of course, uh, the basis for the power. Uh, production. Other important things, oops, sorry, technically, are the side characteristics. What kind of head do we have? Practical feasibility of installations like intake, water base, and powerhouse. And the efficiency of turbines and electrical <coughs> equipment is another parameter here. Concerning the economical issues, the economy of the project uh, is evaluated by uh, comparing uh, costs versus benefit. An example could be the turbine capacity. If you install a larger turbine, you could uh, use more of the water to produce power, but the larger turbine will also cost more money, so you have to find the balance in between that. And of course, this issue would also uh, have impact on the environment since you take more water from the river. Um, of course, it's also very important to, to know the economical framework like development costs, the taxes, fees, energy price, eventual subsidies like the green certificates which we have in Scandinavia, Norway and Sweden together. Uh, this is in principle that the consumer has to buy a certain amount of power which is coming from renewable energy and by this we can finance uh, um, the energy, the renewable energy at a certain price. Um, the required rate of return, feed-in taxes, loan interest rate. Um, uh, one of the differences between Norway and Armenia is, for example, that uh, the energy price is uh, varying during the lifetime of the power station. It can vary a lot. It is uh, de uh, defined by the market, and that's uh, different in Armenia, where you can uh, get the guaranteed price for about 15 years. Yes. Uh, now we have a look at the social and environmental issues. Uh, we have to have a look on all these interests <coughs> from all uses of the water resources. Uh, we have irrigation, a need for irrigation, uh, of course the hydropower production, we have ec ecology, eventual recreation interests, etc. And one important uh, 
point in this uh, environmental uh, discussion is the minimum flow or environmental flow in the river. We will have hear about uh, that uh, in the next presentation from Paiva. And of course, uh, biodiversity is uh, very important too. One important note concerning the optimal design. You have to recognize that uh, this process of uh, optimal design is fairly pro uh, complex. And then in reality, there's not only one optimum. Usually you have several or can have several near optimum solutions, uh, which could be almost equally good or some could prefer another issue a little bit more than another, but uh, there might be different uh, solutions that can be good or close to the optimal design. So what we uh, refer to when we talk about an optimal small hydropower plant is an efficiently and sustainable design small hydropower plant resulting from a good trade-off between all issues discussed earlier. So there will always be a trade-off somehow, but we have to find the right balance between the different issues. How is the process of optimizing uh, uh, going on then? Of course, in the process, we have to make several decisions on uh, different parts of the, of the project. Uh, for example, like intake and dam, dam, we have to define what kind of dam we want to have, the type, the dimensions, what kind of flood spill, should, should there be a fish passage or not. Uh, the same for the turbines, number, what type of turbine capacity, the waterway, should be a pipe, very open pipe, buried pipe, or maybe a tunnel. Uh, power station, the location, layout, and so on. Uh, there might be some restrictions. Could be rules of operation, when we should produce the power and when not, or the rate for the environmental flow. I mentioned that already. And uh, <coughs> could even be some restrictions if we have a reservoir, uh, of, on which level this reservoir should be at uh, different parts of the year, for example. That could be a restriction. We have to make some decisions on the mitigation measures. If the river is going to be drier because we are taking out the water, there might be need to install some weirs. Uh, we could install fish, fish passage uh, at the dam side, probably. Um, fish stocking could be a method to mitigate the effect of the power station. I'm sorry, what is a weir? Uh, if you, um, it's not like a dam, but you fill up uh, like uh, it could be a stone or gravel in the river just to get the water level up, upside of the weir. So it will be like a, yeah, making kind of small lake in the river just to wind dry riverbed. That's a pretty common method, uh, at least if the river is uh, relatively uh, flat, not too steep, but it can make you a water surface. Yes, then I will give you an overview of what kind of uh, authorities are dealing with these issues in Norway. Uh, the main authority for that, uh, the, the development of small hydropower plants, is the Norwegian Water Resource and Energy Directorate, NDE. It has the administrative responsibility for power plants. Um, I will talk mainly about the small hydropower plants for the larger one with installed capacity above 10 megawatt. They have to be handled by both the NDE and the Ministry of Energy. <coughs> and of course, the local authorities and communities are involved too in this process. Concerning the licensing system, I took this uh, definition from the NLE webpage. A license is a document which grants special permissions to a specified company to develop and run power stations and dams specified in the license, including conditions and rules of operation. This means, in, in principle, 
that the license can also be defined as a permission granted by the authorities to cause some damage to the environment. However, those damage should be less important compared to the advantage of the project. The damage should not be larger than necessary and may be mitigated at acceptable costs. And that's uh, actually the core of the whole discussion when I said we have a trade-off between things. So you always compare benefit and costs. That's not only the economic belief part, but also environment and the other things. What is the best for the community? Um, we have uh, some legislative acts. This is basically not allowed to intervene in a water course if this might cause most noticeable damage or inconvenience for public interests. If someone plans to do an encroachment or construction close to or in the river, it must be clarified whether a permit from local and or state authorities is required or not. Is the speed okay for the translation? Can you please explain about what, what, what do you mean saying inconvenience to public interest, for instance? Yeah, this is um, if, if, there, if there's an impact, there will always be some impact if you build something. Let's say, uh, for example, people are using a certain area as recreation area, uh, and you take a, away water at the river, the, the probably the landscape will change, or the use of the IRA cannot be the same as before, so it will cause some inconvenience for them more. Yeah. And in that some case, how much obligatory is the opinion of the public? For instance, yeah. if they are against, but it's in, in not in counter with the legislation, so what? Yeah, yeah. in principle, it's always, uh, at, at once we have some inconvenience, it had to, has to be investigated, and we are coming back to the process how the public is, has uh, possibility to influence that. That's a, an important point. And, and if, if we could, the, in the prior slide, you mentioned that there is, a, by legislation, you're required to do a cost benefit analysis, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and do you monetize all the costs and the benefits? Do you put a monetary value to it? Are you required to do that, or it's more of a uh, hearing people's input and trying to? Yeah, it's a little bit both. I mean, it's not always uh, very easy to put a, a monetary unit on every impact. Of course, uh, what is obviously easy to do is the production. You can, uh, a typical thing is that we, we calculate for different, uh, for different uh, installed capacities, what is the production, and what would be the effect on the, on the uh, income for the power station. But uh, of course, for the it's a, a difficult task to to do that for the for the river environment. But I think uh, Pelliva will come le a little bit back to that in yes, his presentation uh, uh, later. But uh, we don't set uh, a money value on the fish, for think, example. Yeah. I think you should use money. Can we use that one? Yeah, turn it on. Just turn it on. I don't know if the... Uh, <coughs> yeah. Yes, we don't set uh, uh, value in money for, for example, uh, a fish stock. But uh, it's the task for the NVE uh, to decide whether the, uh, the negative impacts uh, is smaller than the, uh, uh, the energy that is uh, produced, so it's uh, the balance there, and that's the main principle of the, the law or the act, what the courses act in Norway. And I guess there is, there are methodologies how to assess, <coughs> the, um, methodologies of assessment of water, loss of water, fish, etc., etc., yeah, to yeah. assess the... We will come back to that in the next presentation. <coughs> Uh, these are the main legislative acts which are in use connecting, connected to the power plants. We have this uh, Water Resource Act, Planning and Building Act, Energy Act, Biodiversity Act and the Pollution Act. 
any planned project must be clarified in relation to these laws before the construction can start. That's important. And the uh, NVE is talking about the kind of when a uh, one window approach, like they call it. That means that uh, all parts of the uh, total hydropower plant, the dam, the power station, the electric installation, power lines, access roads, quarries and tips, and the corresponding acts and authorities are in included in one coordinated process. <laughs> Uh, except the Pollution Act, that's traded a little bit different. <coughs> and the main thing is that NVE has the responsibility to coordinate the whole process. A little bit about the time scale. Uh, sorry, if I'm slowing you, we're slowing you down too much, stop us. But um, this is, these are real issues for Armenia right now, that's why we're asking. Mm, yeah, this one good. window approach is now, especially in the case of mines and mineral rights, uh, is being pushed by a lot of agencies to do the one uh, stop shop kind of approach. Uh, but how do you understand coordination here? Uh, it's basically uh, different agencies still have authority to approve, let's say, the hydrological study, or what is coordination here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, probably more like coordination. In the end, NVE <laughs> is, is, uh, is making the decision. decision. Uh, so it's not just coordinating, but all the things are collected by NVE, and uh, NVE is uh, coordinating, uh, makes the coordination on what should be delivered uh, when and uh, has the dialogue. And, but it's actually a little bit uh, more, uh, uh, not a little bit, it's much more when because they have also the authority to decide things. That's it's the case handler in, in the NVE who handles the whole process, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. That's right. So it's all in-house there. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're welcome to, to stop me and ask questions. That's, that's very good. Concerning the time scale, for smaller <coughs> projects, the licensing process takes from one year to five years usually two or three years as an average. The time needed for appro approval depends on how controversial the project is, the time used on env environmental impact assessments, EIAs, the working capacity of the competent authorities, and whether the fixed time limit for comments on the EIA can be met or not. Um, some steps during the process are also dependent on initiatives from the developer. One limiting factor is, uh, in many cases, the limited <laughs> grid capacity in many regions in Norway. That's actually a problem that uh, the grid is not good enough and that usually takes a lot of time to, to improve the grid. Another major uh, not problem, but uh, concerning the time scale, a very important factor is, uh, is that the working capacity actually. That's, as it is right now, uh, the time uh, scale here is very dependent on the authority, on, on the people working that they have enough capacity, because in the recent years uh, we had a lot of uh, applications. So they are really, and the is slowing down the process in many cases a little bit during the lack of capacity. Yes. In order to uh, secure an optimal and safe use of the available water in the rivers, NVE has developed a number of regulations which are mandatory guidelines, which is the supervision and reports for information. Here's a picture of one. You can order these reports from NVE directly as a paper version or you can download it from the internet. And let me uh, show you some more detail which kind of uh, reports and guidelines uh, that uh, is. Uh, we have guidelines for planning and construction and operation of small hydropower plants. Uh, that's a very central one, especially for non-professional developers. It's, uh, it's a very good help. Uh, here's a lot of information how things work and uh, how sh things should be done. Very valuable. 
uh, we have a guideline for documentation of biological diversity. This guideline provides also a template how the bio biodiversity report should be, and the report must be attached to the uh, application. We have a report on environmental flow for small hydropower plants, technical report for bypass of water, small dams, guidelines for planning, construction and maintenance, also guidelines for design of intakes, guidelines for control of environmental conditions at small hydropower plants, regulations for dam safety, and regulations for flood calculations. Let me show you the different phases in the process of uh, implementing a hydropower plant or planning. We have uh, first the pre-feasibility phase. We call it sometimes also sketch phase. Application phase. After that, we have the investment decision phase. That's when the developer gets the license. Some things could uh, have changed in the meantime, so it's necessary. Uh, to think uh, one more time, should I go for it or not? Uh, we have the de detailed planning phase, building phase, and then operation phase. The most important key factors are usually set in two first phases. So the layout, the installation, the restriction, restrictions, this is given in the license usually. So it's, it's very important for how optimal a, a small hydropower is to focus, set focus on these two phases to get a good design already from the start. And that's uh, the reason why uh, I will focus a lot on the first two phases here in my presentation. We have the pre feasibility phase, also called sketch phase, as I said. Here we have a close look, uh, or let's say a rough look first to the hydrological conditions, the available amount of water and the runoff regime. So it's not only the amount, but also how is the water distributed over the year and probably over the day or month. Uh, do we have a concentrated waterfall? Uh, what is the estimated power production? Proximity to existing roads, access, proximity to existing power lines. Typically, you need a map to do this first stage to get some initial, uh, initial information on the area and, the, and the, um, the size of the catchment and these kind of things. Um, other important parts of this uh, pre-feasibility phase are to uh, evaluate what is the cost, the overall cost of the project. And by that, you can make a ratio from the overall cost to the power production. So how much would it cost per kilowatt hour? Usually uh, um, in Norway, this, um, this can uh, change a little bit what kind of value is acceptable, because that's, uh, that's of course, is the important uh, question for the investor. Is it too expensive or not? So by indicating, uh, by using this value, usually you have a rough idea from the start. And what's interesting is, uh, the interesting thing in Norway, uh, for example, uh, when I started working on that uh, in Sveco in 2003, um, we had the, I, I learned like uh, it is uh, 2.5 Norwegian krona per kilowatt hour was a good project, but it is almost more expensive, we couldn't, uh, um, do, uh, yeah, go for the project and then after a while it changed and it came like four kronos was, was okay and then five and six but now it's on the way back again because the power prices are very low at the moment <coughs> and you have these uh, subsidies in, uh, which also could change a little bit. What's the exchange rate of krona to euro? Uh, uh, I think it's about uh, eight, uh, euro, uh, eight krona per euro at the moment. So, uh, uh, and to the, what's the rate of the... 61 to the yeah. 
So, so it, uh, it appears to be that uh, the range of that profitability uh, Uh, so the range of uh, so the range of uh, profit, uh, profitability starts uh, uh, at uh, some threshold, and that uh, threshold is like uh, uh, four kronas means fifty euro cents uh, per kilowatt hour. If it is uh, uh, more than that, so it is not profitable anymore. And, uh, uh, but uh, there is also also a feed-in tariff uh, uh, mm. in Norway. Yeah, also this is uh, the threshold is connected. That's uh, given by a lot of uh, different variables. The feed-in tariff is one one of that. Yeah, how much money money did do you get? But also, of course, uh, if you. Uh, uh, could be uh, determined a little bit by the by the interest rates or uh, yeah if, uh, the, the political situation. How long? Uh, usually in Norway, the planning uh, or the lifetime of the power station is uh, calculated on about 40 years. So things could, could change in this time. And what kind of opinion do we have about these changes? This kind of thing. So it, uh, the value will always uh, vary a little bit. Pretty high. Pretty high. <laughs> yeah, probably. Okay. Um, yeah, and then of course uh, the environmental issues. Is it acceptable or not? Uh, in some cases, uh, from experience, we know right from the start that there is a large issue. Even if the pro pro project looks very good, we can stay from the start. You will not get the. Uh, Commission of the license. So this is important. Uh, in, in our company in Sweco, we have a lot of uh, biologists and we try to work uh, together right from the start mm -hmm. to, uh, to actually uh, find, out about, uh, find out about these kind of things very early to give the feedback to the developer that uh, there might be issues which will lead to that he will not get the permission. So it would uh, sometimes can we avoid costs unnecessary costs actually. Uh, and of course we uh, have to get information about the landowners in Norway. There can be a lot of uh, waterfalls which are owned by private persons. So we ne need to have agreements with them. Um, the requirements in this phase is uh, uh, among other things, a good uh, resolution and quality map, as I mentioned, for the, for the area. We need to know about the dam site, to plan the waterways, we not need to know the terrain, uh, power station site. A lot of these things can be found already in the map before we go out in the field. Uh, profiles for the dam site. Very important is the, that we have good hydrological data. Here's an example, a runoff series for about eight years. So you see that, the, that the, uh, we have the discharge in cubic meter per second uh, at this axis and then the time scale down here. You see that the, the discharge is varying a lot over the year. And uh, this is important for our choice for the turbines and what kind of capacity we want to install. Each tooth is a year. Yeah, yeah, you can say that like this. Usually we often have a very high peak at the spring flood in many catchments. And during the winter it's uh, getting very dry. The ratio is like 1 to 7, 1 to 8? Yeah, yeah, it can be. Mm. It's varying a little bit, but it can be a high, even higher. 1 to 5. More. Uh, it it can be between. You it can be very close to zero some, to sometimes. So, so that's of course important to know for the power, power production. It would be a very important issue also if you want to plan a reservoir. A reservoir could help you a lot if you have these kinds of runoff regime. How many years data do you need for the application? Uh, 
there's not a fixed number. Usually, uh, this is just an example for a few years. Uh, there is a network of um, uh, hydrometeorological stations in Norway, and these stations usually have a long, uh, long time series, like 30 years or something like this. that. And probably the developer also do all measurements for that. I will come back a little bit to that later. Measurements. Uh, some more requirements concerning uh, considering the environment. We have uh, uh, yeah, we have to decide on the minimum uh, water release or the environmental flow. Reservoir filling level, bypass valve, this kind of things. I, I mentioned that already. Um, the requirements for access and loca location of intake, the water and power station, could be uh, issues like uh, reindeer migration, uh, which would prevent, for example, the open pipeline, uh, um, cultural heritage. Uh, we need to know uh, something uh, about the geotechnical conditions uh, concerning our construction work. Uh, knowledge on the ice conditions, especially important for the intake. In Norway in winter it's pretty cold, so we can have uh, ice which will prevent the water go to go into the intake, which is of course a cost issue then. Flood conditions might be important for the intake and the powerhouse. Uh, a good cost basis for the optimization of the main component components. So y if you want to assess, for example, how large the turbine should be, you need uh, the price for the turbine and then compare different turbine types and the production. So you need some uh, good values for the cost. And the uh, initial value for the maximum capacity for uh, small hydropower parts in Norway, it's, uh, Typical that we often use 200% uh, of the uh, mean discharge over the year. That might be a starting point. Let's have a look at the application phase. Uh, yes, please. May I have another question. Uh, what about the capacity and uh, uh, like uh, the, the Actually, you mentioned. Uh, 200% uh, should be the water resource availability and the capacity should be less than that? Um, the capacity, how much water can go through the turbine, this is what I mean. So in order to not to lose too much water during the flood, for example, you have to have a certain capacity how much of this water can go through the turbine or not. If you have a very low capacity, you will lose a lot of water if it goes. You, you, in this situation, you might have the mean uh, value, let's say, at about 5. So initially, you would try to use the turbine and, of course, the pipe and everything is the same. It should be the same capacity then. Uh, for t uh, down to 10 cubic meter per second capacity and you make a calculation then it would mean if the water the discharge is higher than 10 you would, would lose this amount of water during the blood. Uh, actually, uh, do you ever consider or other cases in Norway that you use two turbines, one big, one small, yeah, yeah. together? That's, that's very relevant. But, I mean, it's not, this is not directly related to the capacity, or let's say it is related. So, when I talk about the install installed capacity, I do not necessarily mean only one turbine. Of course, if you have a regime which is varying a lot, then you would like to run the turbine in the area where it is efficiently running. So, then there might be a need for two turbines. Or it depends, of course, also on the turbine type. But this is, uh, this is an issue to evaluate. Two turbines or type, if you have a Pelton turbine, you could run it on a larger range than Francis turbine, for example. Mm. Three as well? Uh, we have that too. Four. We have a seven. Or eight. Seven? <laughs> yeah, seven. it depends for the larger, it is not small. Different sizes? No, no, not for the small hydropower plants. But uh, two is, is pretty uh, 
a problem, but it's not an unknown. It's Actually, when one say optimized uh, design, so the optimization problem is to uh, find the correct relationship between the large and small one. Mm -hmm. Or if you have three, between all three, depending on the season, water availability, etc. Yeah, there are many issues which will uh, have influence, like uh, some developers prefer just to, to, to use two equal turbines. That will make the operation or the maintenance uh, much easier in many cases. It will get a better price, probably, for the turbines. So you have to calculate on the lifetime for the project what this is, what meaning has this to use two vehicle turbines. So there are a lot of different uh, things to think about when choosing the turbine. Yes, uh, in the application phase, um, a juridical agreement between the project developer and the landowner is settled. And uh, there's also a need for the confirmation of sufficient grid capacity from the owner of the electric electricity grid and what it would cost. Mm -hmm. uh, concerning the preparation for the application, um, of course, we use the funding from the pre feasibility phase, which are initial calculations. We have partly to recalculate or at least verifi verificate these calculations. If necessary, we have to modify the calculation or the, the plan. Uh, and more extensive investigation of the hydrological conditions could be made. made. Um, a new calculation of the estimated production, probably use of long time series. Uh, daily values, that's very important in these various uh, schemes. If you would use uh, weekly values or uh, monthly values, you would get a very nice average and a very high production. But uh, in our cases, it's um, very important to use uh, daily values to take care of How this. How much is the daily difference? Uh, it can be very large in, uh, uh, for small catchments uh, if you have, uh, not for the spring flood probably, but uh, if you have summer floods due to this convective uh, rain, for example, it could be uh, over in one day you get the peak and then in the evening it could be much lower again. So uh, in the spring flood, the spring floods usually are a little bit uh, smoother, but they still have these daily variations due to the melting. For small catchment, this is very visible, usually. Um, yes, uh, and as I mentioned, there might be a requirement for uh, own discharge measurement, especially uh, if you don't have a good uh, official station close by. And if you make own measurements, uh, this will reduce the risk of the investment significantly. And in this case, you ask about the time or the, 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 uh, the how long the time series should be. If you make own measurements, it could even be that the uh, time series for two years or three years would help a lot to pick the right uh, analog station from the official network to compare which is the best station. So on, uh, even short own series in the river of interest will help a lot. Um, we have uh, the environmental and social issues uh, have to be investigated in more detail. Yes. We have an independent uh, impact assessment regarding biodiversity. Yes, a short overview on what the application document should include. We have a table with key figures to give an overview of the catchment, the power plant, like size, runoff, capacity type and number of turbines to cost, description of the layout, hydrological report, map of the area and the layout of the station. We have the assessment of the environmental and social consequences, the time schedule for the implementation of the project, and as I mentioned, it's important to have the agreement in, or, uh, in order to, to get the application. So we need the confirmation from the landowner and the, the grid company. 
uh, what kind of uh, requirements uh, do we have? Um, we have to make a safety classification of the dam, the gates, and the waterway. This means what kind of consequences would it have if some of these parts fail or the dam is breaching. This will lead to a classification uh, which uh, determines uh, what the technical requirements uh, are that apply to the different parts and uh, what plans should be prepared by the, uh, by the owner in order to uh, minimize the risk of failure. Um, so then the application is sent to the MBE, the authority, and the impact assessment uh, and the hydrology report is uh, attached to that. Yes, you might know something about rules. If there is a rule, somebody will break it. <laughs> you might have heard that before. We say, if there's a rule, it must be broken. <laughs> <laughs> so, that uh, leads us to the second topic for today, the monitoring. Mm -hmm. So the main purpose of the monitoring is to ensure that safety and the environment are handled as planned when the license was granted. This is essential both during construction and operation. License holder, the public, and the authorities have responsibility when it comes to monitoring, control, and supervision. I will come back to that. Uh, adequate monitoring of what is happening in and around the hydroelectric plant and transparency of the findings is essential for so society's confidence in the hydropower industry. And I think that's also a very important issue here. I mean, yeah. That's actually one of the reasons why this cooperation was initiated originally. Uh, that, uh, that there were a lot of discussion about uh, hydropower plants and uh, the, I mean, and people uh, were skeptical considering the environment and these kind of things. Um, this uh, figure gives you a, uh, an overview about the processes and uh, roads at different time stages. Uh, we have the authorities down here and the hydropower owner. This is uh, from the point when the license uh, is achieved, actually. We have to make a detailed plan. Uh, we have to make an internal quality control system, a checklist during the construction, perform monitoring and control in line with the interna internal control system here um, yeah, and measure impose, measures imposed by the authorities so that's uh, the task which the hydropower plant owner has to do the authorities parallelly follow up these kind of things they have to approve these detailed plans conduct audit of, this, of safety and environment uh, the MBE uh, is enforcing the hydropower plant owner the investigation, monitoring and measures to improve security or landscape issues. The environmental directorate is enforcing the hydropower plant owner also investigation, monitoring and measures to improve biodiversity and fish stocks. We will hear about that in the next presentation too. Uh, let's have a look at this uh, environmental monitoring. The purpose of this monitoring is to establish a baseline and find trends and conditions in the actual river before we start the construction to give us a state, what is the state of our system at the moment before we change anything. Uh, oops, I'm sorry. Mm, we have to check uh, the compliance with agreed conditions and standards in Norway or internationally, for example, the EU water directive is important for us in Norway too. Uh, we have to measure the impacts that occur during project construction and operation. We need to uh, have some warning systems for unexpected impacts, which then could trigger action plans. Um, 
the monitoring uh, is also, will also determine the accuracy of impact, impact predictions and the effectiveness of mitigation measures. So we can have an impression, is things, are things going like we have planned? We have uh, foreseen some changes and developed mitigation measures and then it's of course important to have a look if these things are actually working like we planned. We have the safety I'm monitoring. Sorry, just, just going back yeah. to the other one. Yes. Is this self-monitored by the developers or yeah. this is the I'm, state agency? Monitoring? I'm talking about the developers uh, monitoring which uh, he's forced to do. Yeah. I will come uh, back a little bit later how this is handled then uh, or what MD is doing with that. But I'm talking now what the kind of power plant owner has to do. Yeah concerning these uh, this, uh, things, uh, uh, yeah, more performing the monitoring, but the NBE and the uh, environmental directorate has a control function in this process. So the safety monitoring, so we have to check that the power plant is constructed in accordance with the permit. Uh, we have to check the technical conditions during the operation and secure that the necessary action can be taken if irregularities are discovered. That's the uh, reason why we need monitoring. This, of course, requires uh, technical staff, technical engineers with the necessary skills and experience to do that task. Let me give an example for a checklist which could be used during uh, the construction phase. Uh, here, an example for the penstock. We have a certain checkpoint here. Uh, for example, uh, if the construction area is marked, there have been no construction work outside the boundaries of these markings. Uh, or if the blasting on slope terrain should be done carefully. We have to uh, uh, insert the code how these uh, different checkpoints perform. If it is not relevant, we set a zero, for example, or if we have no note or small deviation, and so on. We can also make some remarks here. Another example for the dam, similar to the first one. Um, what I wanted to point out it's, is, of course, it might be very obvious that this time things could be should be checked like a very simple thing is the construction area tidy that's very natural it should be tidy and it should be obvious that people are thinking about that but a checklist like this would make sure that you really check this and you can document that you have checked it and that it was okay so that's very important even for things which are very simple and that waste is removed for example yeah. And similar checklists are made for tunnels, rigging, and storage areas, mass deposit areas. So that's uh, the thing that uh, power, uh, the developer has to do. He has to have an internal and internal control system. Um, yeah, for safety and environment. That involves uh, make necessary records in order to document that the undertaking is running in accordance with the requirements in acts, regulations, license, and rules. He has to survive hazards and problems, and on this basis, evaluate risk and possible measures to reduce the risk factors and check to see that the necessary imagined plans have been drawn up. So that's uh, very important for the internal control system. <coughs> All things for this system, he has to survive particular topics that may arise in connection with the natural, uh, natural environment and landscape, uh, implement routines for the non-conformance procedures and preventive and corrective measures. If things are not going like they should, they have to be measures to do corrections. Perform systematic monitoring and review of the internal quality control in order to ensure that it functions as intended. So he has even to have a control system to control the control system. This could be made by internal inspections, for example. 
that he has not to just to assume that everything is okay, you have to check that it's really okay. <coughs> uh, the technical uh, standard and safety, mm -hmm. all dams and pipelines are categorized by the authorities based on possible risk for society and environment. This is usually based on uh, the categorization is based on head, amount of water, flood risk, nearby settlements and infrastructure which could be damaged. Dams and pipes at high risk category have to be controlled by competent experts more frequently than uh, other power plants elements. Uh, for example, uh, we have certain uh, safety classes uh, for dams which are from uh, 0 to 4 and uh, dams up to class um, 3 ha has to uh, have a flood calculation every 15 year. And if you are in a higher risk class, you have to do that more often. This is one, one example. Um, yes. Uh, and MBE has an authorization system for experts who can be responsible for the construction of different types of dams, pipes, or perform flood and dam bridge calculations. So you have to uh, prove that you have the necessary experience and uh, you have worked in this field long enough and have done enough such calculations, you have to send this to MBE and then you will get the personal certificate that you can make these kind of uh, calculations. For example, for risk class uh, one to, uh, yeah, usually you have one for the first risk class and then two to four is one group. But you need the, the necessary skills and experience. At the moment, we don't have anything uh, like this uh, authorization system for environmental experts. Authorization means certification of sorts? Yeah, yeah. So you are so authorized. Anyone can stand up being an environmental expert for it. Yeah, uh, MBE is not giving kind of certification uh, for environmental experts that will show that they are allowed to do a certain calculation. <coughs> That's different for the flood calculation, for example. You need to have this improvement from MZA to do that. Let me give some examples uh, for monitoring. Um, this is a picture of accounting system and video monitoring. Uh, we have a, a construction in the river uh, and the fish need to pass to this uh, small, uh, let's say, hole here, and there is a counter that will count how many fishes are actually uh, passing, and the counter is connected to a video system, which is uh, then taking a picture when the fish uh, is registered. Uh, here is another system, similar system, which is placed in the fish ladder. Which parts are the good fish? Let's Volume and Can you turn up the volume a little bit? It what? Yeah. The volume? Okay. Can you hear better now? Yes. Um, that's a counting system placed in a fish ladder. Here we have a picture of a nice uh, salmon. So it's uh, posing as it comes. <laughs> so this uh, this uh, through pass here is triggering or counting and at the same time triggering the camera. So by this we can uh, determine also approximately size uh, of the fish and what kind of species or uh, yeah, these kind of things. If you don't have a construction like uh, a fish ladder or something, you could uh, probably uh, install a counting system uh, or a system like that, which will grab or lead the fish to one opening <coughs> and then count it there. Uh, here, that's a picture uh, where we had some monitoring of uh, turbidity in the river, installing uh, equipment uh, sensors in the water and monitoring. Um, yes, um, about the environmental flow. 
So we have to have some insurance so that the decided flow rate is actually released. Um, the rules are not always followed, and this is the reason why uh, uh, NVE is um, requiring documentation for that. And they also make controls, and I think these pictures uh, were made by NVE when they come to some of the small hydropower stations and control the pipe for the minimum flow or the environmental flow is blocked here, or here the valve is uh, closed. And this leads uh, to the focus on transparency and public access. Access. So, from uh, January 2010, there was introduced a uh, forced control of this documentation for the environmental flow in Norway. So, the hydropower plant uh, owner must uh, log and document the correct release of the environmental flow. Uh, this is caused <coughs> by law, and economic uh, penalty will be given if it is not fulfilled. Uh, and we developed guidelines to help the, the power plant owners to, to make the correct installations and uh, systems to establish best practice. And uh, a real-time display is also a required to give the public uh, the possibility to control at the site what the other conditions actually are. Um, yes. We have the environment uh, as an opposite uh, interest to the power production. That's especially uh, valid for the minimum flow or the environmental flow. Uh, the flow rate in the river should be large enough to protect the environment, but the flow rate in the power station should be large enough to allow beneficial power production. Of course, these interests are completely different. They're pulling in different directions. But uh, some good reasons for releasing actually decided flow rate uh, is uh, overall, of course, to meet the conditions in the license and by that protect the environment. But for the owner also, I think uh, if he's following this, uh, these rules, the decided flow rate, he will emerge as a serious and professional uh, actor and will have a good reputation. That's uh, very important. And for the government, of course, it must be trustworthy. So the public uh, believes in that the government is doing good work and is not complaining. And the, the, so the public will not complain so much about the projects, I think. The they trust in the government. The flow dat, uh, uh, data is mandated by law to be public? Yeah. yeah. Probably <laughs> not all the data. Uh, uh, I mean, the owner has to store the data, but I think it will not be, the whole series will not be uh, available for all people, but at the site there is kind of a display of possibility for the public to make reading when they are, and they think, for example, ah, that's not enough water here, let me check. And then if they see it is not enough, they will, yes, uh, I will come back to that, they can contact uh, uh, the NBE, for example. I will come back to that a little bit later. Yes, um, so concerning that uh, environmental flow and the documentation, of course, as with many things, the good planning is the key to uh, success. The owner needs to make a careful assessment of the local conditions to find a good solution for release, display, and documentation of the environmental flow, because he also wants to avoid situations where the flow is not large enough. So he has to be sure that uh, the system he's building will work. Uh, the Susan methodology and the detailed plan for the structure to release and to measure the flow must be documented and sent to NBE prior to construction. And NBE is approving the principles of measurement and release, uh, but not the choice of a certain type of equipment or supplier. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, the focus is on the functionality. It should work, that's the most important thing. Uh, concerning the transparency and public control, uh, an information sign must be installed at places where environmental flow is required. And there's a certain information that is needed on the sign 
We have an example here that's in Norwegian, but I will translate uh, the information for you. Uh, there's a contact info information for the owner of the construction, the rate of flow that is to be released at any time, that could vary a little bit. Usually uh, there are these two different values for winter and summer. Sorry. Yes? Are there places where environmental flow is not required? Because you mentioned where is required. Yeah, um, very seldom now. Sometimes it happens earlier, it was uh, more often, but in certain situations, if you, for example, have a river uh, where you can more or less prove that uh, it will not have any impact, almost if there is flow not, you could even have, but that's not very common now, I think, very well. Can you hear it? Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So now, actually, uh, it is uh, not normal that we don't have a run flow, but earlier it was. Mm. More common. Um, so uh, there must be a description on how the flow rate can be controlled at the site. Uh, this is now operation phase, right? Or this is yeah, operation, operation phase. phase. Mm. Operation phase. Yeah. Like here uh, at this site, we have a time period here, first uh, of May to thirtieth of. Uh, September should be 100 liter per second, and it would be 36 uh, centimeters on the scale. Mm -hmm. And then we have the same for winter. We have the winter <coughs> period that should be 50 liter, and then 27 centimeter on the scale. So that's very easy for the public to control. Um, and information uh, on those uh, eventual mail function or violation of requirements should be reported to owner or MDE. We have a similar system for uh, reservoirs. Uh, there are some templates provided by MDE. Uh, for this one was for this uh, environmental flow. And we have it the same or a similar one for reservoirs, where we should have the name of the operator and what is the lowest and highest water level in the in the license which is uh, allowed, and the similar scale or something like that, or even an electronic display could be used. Um, so, what kind of measurements uh, are required by the NVE? So the uh, environmental flow has to be documented, as I said. The accuracy for registered flow has to be within 5%. Interval for registering is minimum one time per hour. Measured data must be available for presentation to NVE on demand. So if they want to make a control, the dam owner has to send that data. A record of data must be stored as long as the power plant is in operation. So the whole lifetime, they have to keep this data. Mm -hmm. So MDE can every time go back to historical records and check uh, if there were some violations. Uh, if the flow rate is calculated based on other parameters, like uh, converting water level to flow rate, uh, also the raw data for the calculation must be stored. Let's have a look on the measurement methods. Uh, there are mainly two methods. Methods We can register flow in the pipe, or we can register flow based on the water level. Uh, the chosen method must account for local conditions, uh, like climate, physical conditions, and landscape. In Norway, in the cold winters, we, we usually have uh, problems with ice, or can easily have problems with ice. Uh, so most recommended is the method uh, is through the pipe with arrangement for adjustment of the flow rate. So you can need some kind of a valve in the pipe. And you could, for example, have a small housing around to protect uh, against uh, the frost and these kind of things, or snow. And if you measure in the pipe, this measure is based on a sensor mounted on the pipe or even in the pipe, and the control and calculation unit to convert the signal from the measurement sensors uh, to discharge. Uh, typical method for release uh, to pipes could also be uh, 
pipes uh, at the uh, lower side of the dam. In this case, for example, two different pipe diameters, uh, which could account for uh, the flow in the winter season and the summer season. Uh, this is sometimes a little bit difficult to calculate exactly what kind of discharge you actually will get, will get uh, if you have a fixed pipe diameter because of the hydraulic conditions uh, which cannot be predicted very exactly at least. Uh, so in many cases we had that the release actually was a little bit uh, too large then because the owner was afraid to uh, get under, under the license uh, value. Um, other measurements method uh, to have a small V-notch profile below the dam uh, yeah, or you can measure the water level intake in the intake basin in connection to a part of the dam. Uh, yeah, if you have this uh, in a natural profile you might construct a rating curve but usually uh, this is not um, precise enough. Well, if you could just wrap it up. Yeah, yeah, I'm almost finished. Um, yeah, that's another uh, picture of the V notch. You can actually read directly uh, what kind of flow value you have. Uh, they also give a certain advice which methods are not allowed uh, according to the regulations. You don't can you cannot measure by having a counter bore at the crest of the dam or by using flood. Uh, floodgates, this is for too rough. Uh, yeah. Other methods connected to special types of uh, intakes, like the roller intake. Yeah, I, yeah. Here uh, I have some links where I get the, some of the information, or at least people that are interested can go into their, the websites. They have a lot of information on how, how they do that, also in English at NVE. And of course, uh, our project, uh, the, the Norwegian Armenian Collaboration Program, has also <coughs> an own website here, Small Hydro Armenia, uh, where you can download uh, all the reports which we uh, worked out during the work group meeting in PDF format. And there's uh, also a lot of information here. Yeah. yeah, that was it. Great. Thank you for listening. Back to the next one, uh, maybe 10 minute break. But any questions? Hartzish Khan? Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. um, yeah, I must have Yeah, usually, usually that's uh, that's related. Uh, uh, depends on the on the size of the power station and the, the amount of water. Um, we have seen that especially um, uh, connected to. Uh, we had some cases in Norway where connection to these green certificates where people applied for the certificates and MBE controlled the power stations uh, concerning uh, uh, the parameters and if it was built right and then uh, when MBE actually they, uh, they found out in some cases that uh, people installed too large capacities and then MBE was calculating that backwards how much uh, production you have uh, <coughs> as a plus during this installation, uh, the too large installation, and then the fine was calculated by that. So, so the amount uh, matters uh, also for, for the case of the environmental flow. It's so you'll never benefit from violating? No, no. 
As for me, I'm uh, interested in um, the following. Uh, you were talking about um, the independent uh, environmental impact assessments. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how is it guaranteed in Norway that the assessments are independent? Because as far as I know, it is paid by the owner, not yeah. so. And another question, second question is, um, how, how much do they, in Norway, have to pay, I mean the owners of the plants, do they have to pay for the use of water, if so? Um, the first question is, uh, usually uh, this, it's right that the uh, assessment is paid by the owner, but the companies that are performing it, uh, they're independent uh, and, let's say, recognized by NVE as uh, independent uh, companies, and NDE is also controlling uh, this, uh, this work which is done. So uh, I think it's also a little bit a matter of trust. But it's not ever. Yeah. <coughs> as far as I know, there's no, in this case, there's no uh, third party control. I mean, there's the consultant performing the SIA, and there's the NBE controlling it. Mm. There is no third party control. That's so, correct. as you say, there is, this, there is some uh, aspect of trust here. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Mm -hmm. And then, water use fees? Yeah, uh, you don't have any fees for the use of water. If you have the agreement with the owner of the, the waterfall, which has this, uh, what we call this fall of rights in, in Norway. You pay the owner, but you don't have any extra fees. So the owner has paid for those rights to the state? Uh, yeah, usually they own the ground, and then they own they also the right in many cases. Uh, all right. Norwegian. Okay. That's us. Norwegian rivers. Okay. Norwegian rivers, uh, I guess they are different from Armenian ones. Armenians mostly, I mean small rivers, are uh, season rivers. Uh, I mean that uh, main water flows goes in spring season. So is it okay if the hydropower plant uh, work in all over the uh, all the year over the year? Uh, or it is acceptable to work, for instance, in small rivers, season power plants. Yeah, um, it's not very unlike the Norwegian situation in many rivers that you have a large spring plant, but it's not getting that dry as it is in Armenia. But uh, it still could be profitable. That's just a matter of uh, the calculation between cost and benefit to calculate production that you can have, let's say, from. Uh, March or April to June or Jul July, and if this uh, the intake pro uh, the income from that is covering all the costs, it still can be profitable. <coughs> and second question: Is there a minimum measure of water which should be in the river uh, all the time? I mean, uh, minimum is there a minimum re uh, minimum measure in any um, kind of like it, as an environmental obligatory. Uh, condition or not? Yeah, that's uh, what uh, all the discussion is about the minimum flow. But of course, it's uh, we have to find some <coughs> kind of definition. How how can you find this? We have method for it that I don't present. Uh, can make the presentation of all of that. We will come back a little bit later in the next presentation to that. Of course, there has to be some way to decide. But uh, no, it's it's not easy to give an exact number for that. But we do that as best as, I, as we can, and uh, they are provided guidelines and regulations how we should do that. Well, two percent, of course, they get room. 
and they don't want to buy it, they don't want to invest, mm. they won't get the license. Yeah, that's uh, it. Orange Ah, okay, but Orange Key is a license. It's 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 a a a a no, that's right. The, the, the agreement with the grid owner is uh, the base uh, is needed for the application. So if they don't have a guarantee for that, they won't yeah, get the license. For and I mean, in some cases, this has been the uh, Yeah, yeah. In many cases, that's uh, that's a problem for for the developers. In, in certain areas, this has been a problem. Yeah. But the grid has not have the capacity. The grid owner has the investment, so this stops the number of power stations. Yes, uh, as this presentation refers to Norway-Armenian cooperation, so I would like to now uh, ask about how it can be beneficial for Armenia. And I would like to bring an example. For example, uh, the uh, Windows 7 operation system, very, I think very be uh, good operation system, but for my <coughs> Pentium 2, it's not. <laughs> Beneficial. So, what's offer from Norwegian side for I, Armenia? I and, uh, can see what you are aiming at, but um, the problem is that countries are different, and uh, of course, uh, different uh, yeah, uh, basics. Uh, what can be done? But uh, I think uh, you could, uh, if you are more interested in the topic, uh, how this can be transferred, and uh, what what of what of our experience is useful for you, we could probably uh, try to read a little bit in these uh, reports which we made, uh, because I think uh, many of these uh, things can also be done in Armenia. What uh, what I showed. If so I could just add, I think the task is ours to figure out how to learn from Norway. We've, we've been given the lessons from Norway, now we need to figure out how to learn from it. It's not, it's not going to be, the, the lessons learned is not going to be delivered. We have to figure it out, it's not really sure. Yeah, we, we, at least during this project, we made a lot of suggestions how, how that's going to be done. So, so that's actually about, the, uh, that was uh, some, some topic in the report make a comparison and to come up with recommendations to them. One very quick clarification question from her and we'll go to the... Yeah. <laughs> Ureman Hartz of Vera Berwuma, Gateri, Sandra, Bervatsutian, Vera Bera. I see when you take the river, Karuts Wum, Evoch, the Mihek, Alkani, Mikani Hek, Inchpese Zermot, Hamakar Kune, Aik Park, I see when Dukhash Parkum, Gate Verat Sandra Bervat, cumulative effect, Kash Tasat, Dukhash Parkum, Ektevoch. You have inchpese. Uh, yes, that has been uh, done, uh, especially for regions where people want to construct many power stations. And uh, NBE has uh, um, set the first uh, applications on hold to get in more applications for the whole region and then uh, decide what is uh, 
summarize the impact of these stations yeah, that's, that has been done. I'm going to violate my own statement. One last question. Yeah, it's very short. Um, Maria Antosova, I'm also working with Peter for the German Ministry. Um, I have a very short question. Uh, are there cases known from Norway where during the construction or the implementation the environmental impact assessment was were neglected and what were the consequences of that for the constructors or the owners of the HPPs? Uh, after construction or in the um, before, during the construction yeah. or during the implementation phase, if there are cases known where the yeah yeah there are cases known and that will uh, usually uh, lead uh, either to penalties or that the uh, uh, then owner has to take uh, measures to change things. So that's that that's yeah. If I may, I I believe there is one or two examples where actually the owner or the developer has been imprisoned after severe violations to the, not ESIA, but I guess to the construction permit, right? Yeah, uh, there was uh, one case lately where, for example, uh, the plan said that the uh, owner should build uh, a tunnel, the waterway in the tunnel, and he built a pipe, uh, if I remember right, and that got really consequences, he had to go uh, to prison. Okay. Um, are there consequences <coughs> where the HPPs were shut down? Uh, yeah, HPPs were they shut down? Uh, I'm not quite sure if I have uh, concrete examples for that, but at least uh, usually uh, they have to change things and maybe they would get a certain uh, deadline to do things, to change things before they have to shut down. And if this happens, were there cases when they couldn't do it or they they refused to do it? And if this happened, is there any uh, guarantee system? Does the state have a fund or something? Do they pay any deposit to the state so that the state no, can do that? There's no deposit or something like that, as I know. But uh, then if they wouldn't change uh, and wouldn't follow the rules, uh, they couldn't uh, use the power station anymore. I think then it has, has to shut down, but I don't know. So there's no performance bonding or uh, performance insurance? No, I don't think so. These cases are quite rare. Yeah, I yeah. know. When, when there are violations, which is... Uh, yeah. The cases are rare. rare. Yeah. And they're you have to use the microphone. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they're rare. They extent, happen, but no, they're, they're very rare. Yeah. In Norway, at least. Some systems work. Okay, so let's take this.